Welcome to the Lifehouse Church Podcast. More information about Lifehouse and our senior pastors, Richard and Helen Kabakian, can be found at lifehouse.com.au. We hope you enjoy the following message. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning from uh, the book of Genesis chapter 12, just verses 1 to 4. If you're not familiar with the Bible, that's okay. Let me bring you up to speed. This passage in the Bible describes the first encounter that a man named Abram, who we know as Abraham, has with God. Abraham becomes the father of all those who have faith in God. And this is the first time that Abraham personally encounters God. Let me read for you what happens. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house and go to a land that I will show you. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'll bless you and make your name great and you'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him and Lot, his nephew, went as well. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Now it's easy to read that story and to miss the incredible step of faith that Abram takes. The Bible says Abram has lived in Haran 75 years. Years. I don't know how long you've lived at your address. We lived at 6 Browning Street, Mount Louisa Townsville for six years. And with six years, it's longevity, which breeds familiarity. Having lived at the same address six years, we had out of all the coffee shops in Townsville, our coffee shop. In fact, at our coffee shop, we had our table. And when we sat at our table in our coffee shop, the waitress no longer asked what we wanted. She would simply look in our direction and we would say the usual. I like that. With longevity comes familiarity. Out of all the shopping centres in Townsville, we have our preferred shopping centre. And at our preferred shopping centre, we have our preferred grocer. We don't really think about things these days. We just go on autopilot because with longevity comes familiarity. When I go for my biannual haircut, I have my my preferred barber. And so in Townsville, having lived there for many years, we're just familiar with the place. Well, you can imagine for Abraham having lived 75 years in the same location, he can't remember the last time he used Google Maps. I mean, after 75 years, longevity breeds familiarity and into his familiarity steps God. And God says, I want you to go. Abraham says, well, Lord, I'll do whatever you say. Where am I going? And God says, I'll show you where you're going when you get there. Now, it's one thing for Abraham to agree to this, but he's got to go home. And speak to Mrs. Abraham. And how many of you know women are different? For a man, longevity is just about familiarity. But for a woman, it's not just familiarity, it's sentimentality. After 75 years, she's finally got curtains that match the furniture. (laughs) After 75 years, he's finally painted the house and cleaned up the garage. And so Abraham sits Sarah down and says, Sarah, I need to talk to you. She says, what about? You're a man. You never want to talk. He says, I know, but God's been speaking. She looks incredulously at him and says, well, God's always speaking to you. What's up this time? Last time He told you to kill our son. He says, no, no, I'm serious. He said, God, God's, God's been speaking to me. So they sit down at the kitchen table and she says, well, what did He say? And Abraham says, well, well, well God said, we've got to leave. Sarah folds her arms and says, leave to where? You can imagine Abraham shifting nervously in his seat, looking at the carpet and and, and replying to her, uh, God said He'll he'll tell us where we're going when we get there. How many of you know that's not good enough? Sarah's got a hundred questions concerning where they're going. How far is it? He doesn't know. Will it be safe where we're going? He's unsure. Uh, Will we know anybody? Will we like the food? Will we speak the language? Will we understand the culture? And to every question Sarah has, Abraham says, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. I always thought when I gave my life to Jesus, everything would become sure. These days, I'm less sure than I've ever been. And then I became a preacher and I thought, surely if I'm a preacher, if I'm the guy up front, the man of God, everything in my life will now be certain. And I've got to confess, I am less certain about life than I have ever been. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 says of Abraham that by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go to the place he would receive as an inheritance. Listen to it. And he went out not knowing where he was going. That sounds like your life. Abraham, the father of faith, went out not knowing where he was going. Let me explain to you how this works in our life. Uh, Let me, for the sake of illustration, 
divide you into two, because let's face it, most of you are slightly bipolar. And, and so <laughs> let, let's say that, that, that we, if we divide you into two, there, there's, the, um, there's the spiritual dimension to your life and, and there's a natural dimension to your life. You understand that, right? We are natural but spiritual beings. Uh, for instance, at your funeral, someone will say, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, because we are created out of the dust of the earth. But how many of you know it's God breathed dust? Yeah. Winston Churchill once said, all men are worms. I just happen to think of myself as a glowworm. And so uh, we are dust, but God breathed dust. So we are uh, identifying with the beasts of the earth in terms of our dust and our body, but we identify with God because we have the spark of the divine within us. So, so we are natural, but spiritual. Now we are innately curious beings, aren't we? It starts early. Toddlers start asking why, why? And, and that never stops, that the questions become more complex, but our desire to know and to understand never ends. And so we ask questions. For instance, one of the questions we ask is, is, um, is who am I? Or, or the question of identity. How many of you know identity? How many of you know that, that's a spiritual question? You look unconvinced. Let me prove it to you. Um, not once is your dog ever sat in its kennel thinking, I know they call me Rover, but who am I really? <laughs> that, that, that's a spiritual question. Um, so, so we ask, who am I? We, we ask questions of, of purpose and, and meaning. And, and so the, the question of meaning, that's a spiritual question. Um, your dog doesn't chase a car down the road, yapping at its tyres, thinking this is fun, but what am I really supposed to be doing with my life? A dog doesn't ask questions of meaning and purpose, but we do. And then there are other questions such as uh, what happens when you die, life after death. That's a spiritual question. Now, before I gave my life to Jesus, my answer to all those questions was, don't know, don't know, don't know. Who am I? I don't know. I, when I finish school, I'm going to have a gap year and, and travel to Europe to try to find myself. I don't know who I am. I, I, I know who my parents expect me to be. I know who the world is trying to conform me to become. I, I, I know who, who pop culture says I could be, but I, yeah, I don't know. And, and as for meaning and purpose in life, I'm just trying to make it through to next weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe get a bigger limit on my credit card, get, get, get a better looking partner. I don't know what the purpose in life is. And, and as for life after death, I don't want to think about turning 40. And, and so... So, so my answer to all of these questions was, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And how many of you know we are not designed to live our lives with feet firmly planted in midair? Yeah. I can't stand not knowing. I, I mean, it, it's killing me to not know. And so what we do is we pretend the spiritual dimension to our lives does not exist. And we focus entirely on things that are natural because it anesthetizes us from being unsure about existential things. Thank God for Hollywood. We need Hollywood. The reason we have an entertainment industry in a secular Western society is because we need something desperately to distract us. Because if Hollywood don't bring out another Marvel blockbuster, I'm gonna start thinking about identity and meaning and life after death. And I don't wanna think about that because I don't know. And I can't stand not knowing. So, so let, let, listen, let's just talk about where we're gonna live and let's just talk about how much money we can get. And let's just talk about next weekend. And let's just do a five-year plan. And let's just focus on things that we can control because I can have a measure of control over that. And I need control. Yeah. And so before I became a Christian, I was a spiritual being in denial, focusing on natural things. And so when it came to spiritual things, don't know, don't know, don't know. But, but I just focused on natural things. I, I know where I'm gonna live. I know where I'm getting my next pay packet from and I've got next weekend sorted. Well, then I came to a church like this and I didn't understand it all, but I, from the moment I drove in and met the car park team, God help us. <laughs> that there was something about this place. And, and I remember saying something like, from the moment I drove in, it, it felt like home. And it wasn't really home. What, what I was trying to express, but I didn't have the language, was I felt the presence of God. I didn't know that's what it was, but, but I felt it. And when opportunity was given to say yes to Jesus, I, I was one of the first people to say, I, I need Jesus in my life. And I became a Christian. Now, now, when I gave my life to Jesus, Jesus started to answer the spiritual questions that I'd been asking. Who am I? I'm, I'm a child of God, made in the image and likeness of God. And as for meaning and purpose, well, my personality, my disposition, my different talents and giftings were all given me by God to use, to glorify Him and to serve my fellow man. Amen. And when I died, Jesus said He's already gone ahead of me to prepare a place and to be absent from the body is to be present with the And so for the first time in my life, I was sure of spiritual things. It was an awesome feeling. 
I was sure. And then something most unexpected happened. God began to speak to me. And He asked me to do things. He asked me to give things away. He asked me to go to different places. He asked me to adjust my career path and my future. He asked me to connect with different kinds of people. And, and when He asked me to do things, I would say, well, Lord, I'm, I'm excited because you're speaking to me and, and I want to obey you. But, but before I do, if you could just tell me, like, if I do that, how am I going to pay for it? And, and where will I live? And who's going to go with me? And in five years' time, what does that look like? And I discovered God is big on command and very light on detail. Because when I asked Him, where am I going to live? He was silent. When I said, how am I going to pay for it? He was quiet. When I said, who will go with me? He had nothing to add. And so suddenly, I went from being clueless about spiritual things, but very sure about every other dimension in my life, to now being sure God was speaking to me, but being unsure about how anything was going to work. Oswald Chambers put it like this, to be certain of God is to be uncertain in all our ways. Because you never know what a day may bring. This is generally said with a sigh of sadness, which would rather be an expression of breathless expectation. To be sure of God is to be unsure of pretty much everything else. Because you just don't know what God's going to ask you to do. And for most people, they can't stand not being sure. But, but, but it's, it's the knowledge that God is speaking to me. And I don't know how it's going to pan out, but I know it's God that makes the Christian life an adventure. Yeah. This is what gives the Christian life its, its dynamic and, and its impetus that God is encouraging me to take steps of faith. Amen. You know, it's my certainty of who God is that enables me to embrace the uncertainty of what following God necessarily means. What I'm trying to share with you this morning is the more sure you are of Jesus, the less sure you're going to be about pretty much everything else. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 20, Jesus puts it like this. Foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay His head. What on earth is Jesus talking about? He's talking about foxes and birds and comparing them with the Son of Man. He's comparing natural creatures with a spiritual creature. He says, you want to talk about natural creatures, birds and foxes, they make sure of natural things. A bird is sure of its nest. A fox is sure of its hole. But the Son of Man, He hasn't got a clue where He's sleeping tonight. In other words, Jesus says, I'll make you a promise. If you follow me, you'll never really be sure of anything. In fact, sometimes I wonder if that's the only real promise that God makes. God promises, if you give your life to me and follow me, I promise you, you'll never be certain of anything for the rest of your life. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, Jesus calls the disciples to follow Him. Listen to how it happens because there's an amazing, miraculous transaction that perhaps you've never considered. It says, Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and Andrew, casting nets into the sea, for they were fishermen. Now, don't you love the Bible? It's written for people of all levels of comprehension. Casting nets into the sea, for they were fishermen. No kidding. I figured they were fishermen. That's why they were casting nets into the sea. If they were accountants, they probably wouldn't have been doing that. They would have been stealing money. But, but they were casting nets into the sea, for they were fishermen, right? And, and so Matthew's not thinking that we're slow on the uptake. He's trying to emphasise and make a point. He's saying fishing is not just what they did, it's who they were. If you said to, uh, to the disciples, um, what will you be doing tomorrow? They, they would have said fishing. If you'd said, what will you be doing in 12 months time? They would have said fishing. If you said, do you have a five-year plan? They, they would have looked at you fishing. If you asked them, what will your kids do when they finish school and university? They said, well, fishing. And, and the reason they would have said this is because their father before them was a fisherman and their grandfather before him was a fisherman. Fishing was diarised, regimented, routine. If you looked in their outward, exp outward express, it, it said fishing. And into their certainty, into their regimented, routine life, wow. steps Jesus. Yeah. Now, now listen to what happens. Next verse says, Jesus said to them, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Now, now with 2,000 years of hindsight, we know when Jesus says, I'll make you fishers of men, He's saying, I'm going to make you the apostles. You'll start churches around the world and the gospel will spread from coast to coast. But, but in that moment, they didn't have a clue what a fisher of men yeah, is. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't even make sense. And so Jesus says, drop everything Follow me, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Now, I don't know about you, but I would have said, can we have coffee? Because I've got some questions. For instance, is, is, is there a website I could go to? Uh, is, is there a prospectus? It, do you have like people I could talk to who have done the fisher of men internship? Um, 
is it, is it government accredited? Like, like if I do the whole Fisher of Men thing, like, like do I get a job at the end of it? Is, is it like, like how does it, it, does it work? What's it gonna cost? Where am I in five years? And, and, but Jesus is gone. He walks into their certainty. He walks into their familiarity. He, he walks straight into their world. He says, drop everything, follow me. I'm gonna make you fishers. And then he just walks off. And, and I, but, 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 but he's gone. And here's the miracle. The next phrase says, they immediately left their nets and followed Him. Do you realise the the profundity of that? In an instant, they dropped everything and followed Him not knowing where He was going. I'll tell you what happened. In that moment, they became so sure that this is not just another impressive rabbi, not just another great moral teacher, not just a profound miracle, but this is the Son of God of God. This is God personified. This is the fullness of the Godhead dwelling bodily. This is the long awaited Messiah, the Christ. And they were so sure of who Jesus was. In that moment, they were willing to be unsure of everything else for the rest of their lives. If you were to consider your own life in hindsight, you would find that the most telling moments, the pivotal moments of your life were those moments you were prepared to abandon certainty. Think about when you got married. You weren't completely sure. How could you have been sure? I mean, gentlemen, how could you? Oh, I know you're the one. No, you're a liar or naive. You can't be sure she was the one. There are three billion women on the planet. You've not had coffee with all of them. So when she walked down the aisle, you were pretty sure, mostly sure, sure enough to take a punt. But you're kidding yourself if you say you were totally sure. How could you have been sure? You were sure enough to take a risk when we adopted our children. We weren't sure about adopting our children. We we had waited six years to adopt our children. And when the social worker said, we've got two boys for you to adopt, we said, well, before we say yes, we've got some questions. For instance, have you got a photo? What do they look like? And we wanted a photograph because we wanted to be sure they were from uh, Africa and not Tasmania. And... um, (laughs) And they, they didn't have any photo, they, they had hardly any information about these two boys at all. The, the only thing they could tell us is they're twins, they're six months old, and, and listen to this, the Ethiopian authorities described them as happy and handsome. <laughs> and Samantha went, oh, they're happy and handsome. I said, sweetheart, they're trying to get us to adopt them. <laughs> they're hardly going to say, we've got a couple of kids, they're sad and ugly. Would you like them? <laughs> all the orphans are happy and handsome. They're all just terrific kids. And, um, and, and so all we knew is that before we married, God told us to adopt not one, but two, and not just from anywhere, from Africa, specifically Ethiopia. And we were so sure of what Jesus had said, we brought these two boys into our house, not knowing what we were bringing into our home. We're still trying to figure it out. <laughs> when we began a church in Cairns, I mean, we knew God had said start in Cairns, but, but, but how are we gonna pay for it? Is anyone gonna come? Yeah, I'm flat out pastoring one church, let alone then it was gonna be three campuses. How are you gonna cope? And the answer to all of those questions was, don't know, don't know, don't know. All we knew was that Jesus had said, plant a church in Cairns. And at some point we became so sure that God had said we must do that. We were willing to do it though, unsure of how it was going to work. You know, the companion story to Matthew 4, where Jesus calls the fishermen is Matthew 19 where there's a young guy, and when I grow up, I want to be him. Um, We don't know his name, but he's described as the rich young ruler. I want to be him. Um, He's rich. Oh, you're so sanctified here. That appeals to me. Woody Allen was once asked, how much money would it take to make you happy? And he said, just a little bit more. And um, so, so I'd love to be rich. And this guy's rich, but he's not just rich, he's young. Did you understand the importance of that? What's the point of being rich when you're old? There's only so many ways you can pimp your walker. And, um, but, but, but he's rich and, and he's got the vitality to enjoy it. He's rich, he's young and he's powerful. This, this guy's practically a Kardashian. And um, which makes his question to Jesus all the more curious. He says, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? And I'm thinking, are you serious? Like you're rich, young, what more do you want? And he says to Jesus, I, I don't know, but maybe I should move churches because... You know, Lifehouse isn't doing it for me anymore. I, I don't know what's wrong with me, but, but, but maybe I should. And Jesus said, well, since you mentioned being good, why don't you try being good? He says, being good, I've been good all my life. So he's not just rich, young and powerful. He's an upstanding member of his faith community. 
And he still says, I don't know what's wrong with me. So Jesus says, I can fix you. And notice Jesus doesn't say you need to read the Bible more. You need to pray more. You need to do Bible college. Jesus says, this is what you need to do. You need to get rid of everything you have and follow me. In other words, Jesus says, here's your problem. You're bored. You're so diarised, so regimented. You're so sure of everything. There's no room for me, but I can fix that. Give away everything you have. So you have no idea how you're going to survive and then just follow me. And the rich young ruler said, I can't. This is the greatest offer that any human being has ever been given in history. A three-year internship with the Son of God. Front row seats to the greatest show on earth. When Jesus preaches the, the Beatitudes, you're there. When He walks on water, not only do you watch, but you can have a turn if you wish. When Jesus feeds the 5,000, He doesn't just do it, He does it through you so you participate in the miracle. Jesus says, follow me. And this guy says, but but, but where am I going to live? And how am I going to pay for this? And and, and is anyone else that I know going to come? And and He walks away sad, never to be heard from again. He becomes a footnote in history. Meanwhile, the rough as guts, uncouth, undisciplined, over-emotional fishermen become world travellers 1,500 years before the age of exploration. Uh, Peter ends up in, in Italy, John in Asia, uh, uh, James ends up in Spain, Thomas in India. They don't just travel the world, they turn the world upside down. That's so true. If I was Jesus, I would have wanted the rich young ruler as, as part of my team. He's rich, he's young, he's powerful, he's educated, he's good. Peter just swears all the time. But the one thing, the only qualification for doing great things for God is not your education, not not your morality, not how sophisticated you are. It's just a willingness to let go. A willingness to go forward, though not knowing where you're going, but knowing I've heard from Jesus and that is enough. Here's my question for you this morning. What certainties do you need to sacrifice? Because an incredible breakthrough is one uncertain step away. Be more afraid of a lifetime of regret than of a moment of uncertainty. Do you get that? Be more afraid of a lifetime of regret than of a moment of uncertainty. Ecclesiastes 11 verse 4 says, Whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. In other words, you're never going to be completely sure of anything. Now, I'm not saying don't do due diligence. I'm not saying don't use the wisdom God's given you. I'm not saying don't get good advice, but I am saying there comes a point of, they call it paralysis of analysis, where you've analysed this thing within an inch of its life and you can never be completely sure of anything. There comes a moment where you've just got to take a step of faith. And so many people miss the plan of God because until they've crossed every T and dot and every I, they're not moving. And God never gives you a 10-point plan. He never gives you the roadmap before you start. He simply gives you a word and says, follow me. Andy Stanley said, there will always be an element of uncertainty. Generally speaking, you're probably never gonna be more than 80% certain of anything. Waiting for greater certainty might cause you to miss an opportunity. Uncertainty actually increases with increased leadership responsibility. The more responsibility you assume as a leader, the more uncertainty you'll be expected to manage. The cost of success as a leader is greater uncertainty, not less. I remember when I started coming to Lighthouse Church because I'd heard about it. I'd heard how Pastor Rich and Helen have got everything sorted and this place runs like clockwork. And I was not disappointed. I came and I thought, man, the car park team, the ushers, the kids ministry, it's so well organised. I began to get involved. They let me stand on the door, hand out brochures as people arrived. And then gradually I became more and more part of the leadership core. And when I got close to the leaders, to my horror, I realised they haven't got a clue what they're doing. (laughs) I thought, you know, another campus in Doncaster and now we're going to Poland. And man, they've got this thing sorted. They haven't got a clue. (laughs) They're making it up as they go. And that's when I fell in love with this church. Because why would I want to be a church where they're so regimented, routine and dire, they don't even need God. I want to be part of a great adventure where we don't know much, but we know God spoke. We don't know much, but we know God said, go that way. And I don't know how we're going to pay for it. I don't know how we're going to do it. I don't know how we're going to resource it. All I know is God said, move. If Abraham had waited until he knew everything, he would never have left Haran. He would never have had a miracle child. His descendants would never have possessed the promised land and he would never be known as the father of faith. Yeah, 
You know how um, when you're preaching, <laughs> like typically you would, you sort of build the message to like a, a crochet and then, but that's just the end. <laughs> um, no, no, wait, wait. Don't clap for incompetence. I'm, I'm so, I, I didn't actually look at my notes, but it just, it just stops. Um, all right. Muso's come back. Um, <laughs> whew, uh, we can, we can, re- all right, here's what we'll do. Um, we're going to have an altar call now. <laughs> and so in conclusion, we're going to do a pop quiz. Because that'll work. Um, all right, so here's how we'll finish. All right, we're going to do a pop quiz. All right, so um, you know how they have words to describe groups of animals? Please help me here. I'm, I'm feeling very vulnerable right now. Um, so, so for instance, a, a group of um, cattle is called a, a herd. All right, so let, let's, let's do a pop quiz and see how, how smart you are with these things. Um, so a group of birds is called a? Excellent. A group of bees is a? Not a hive, a swarm. Excellent. A, uh, a, group, of, um, a group of dogs is a? Excellent. A group of crows is a? Please don't say that in church. Um, a, uh, all right, let's make it a bit more difficult. A group of dolphins is a? A pod. Excellent. A group of, um, a group of wombats. Which is weird because I've never seen wombats like hanging out in a group. A group of wombats is called a wisdom, a wisdom of wombats. Because when you do see three or four wombats huddled together, that is the font of all knowledge and wisdom. Do you know what a group of crocodiles is called? This is true. A group of crocodiles is called a congregation. I preached in that church last week. <laughs> a congregation of crocodiles. Barely escaped with my life. Do you know what a, um, a, a group of vultures is called? This is true too. It must be, I looked it up on Wikipedia. Um, a group of vultures is called a committee. A committee of vultures. It's the women's committee. We, um, we're in Africa and so we went on safari. We've been on a number of safaris and uh, we were, were pretty keen to, um, to see, you know, the big five. And, and last time we finally saw a rhino, um, which was so brilliant. Do you know what a group of rhinos are called? A crash. A crash of rhinos. There's two things you need to know about a rhino. Firstly, a rhino can run at 50 kilometres an hour. That's quick. I mean, a squirrel can run up 42 kilometres an hour. And that's not any squirrel, that's like a Usain Bolt squirrel. Top speed, 42 kilometres an hour, but but a rhino can run up 50 kilometres an hour. The second thing you need to know about a rhino is a rhino can't see more than nine metres in front of its own face. Think about the physics of this. You've got this hulking great beast running at 50 kilometres an hour with no idea what's nine metres in that direction. But how many of you know a rhino doesn't need to know what's out there? It just needs to know what God put right here. And so you have a crash. I reckon it's about time we had a crash of Christians who don't know what's out there, but I sure as heck know what God's put in here. Greater is He that's in me than he that's in the world. God works all things together for good for those who love. He's got a hope and a future. I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. I don't know what's out there, but I know what God's put in here. Listen to me for a second. It's an oxymoron to find timid, shy, nervous, fretful rhinos cowering in the shadows, afraid to take a step. Rhinos are bold because though they don't know what's round the corner, they're very confident of what God's put here. It's an oxymoron to have a church that's nervous, afraid, shy, timid, anxious, wanting to be very, very careful. We don't know what's around the next corner. Life is full of twists and turns. I don't know what's happening next week, but I do know what's happening in here. And when we become sure of God, we're willing to go forward though unsure what's round the next bend 
what's over the next crest. I don't know what's gonna happen next month, but I am sure of who God is in me. And for that reason, I say to Pastor Richard and Pastor Helen, let's just keep crashing through. Whatever the obstacles, the challenge, whatever the unknowns, we're not gonna sit on our hands, passive and waiting. Let's keep moving forward, though unsure where we're going, because we know whom we have believed and I am persuaded He is able. A crash of Christians. If ever our country needs Christians, there is a lot of uncertainty in our world. None of us know what the future is, but we know whom we've believed. And being persuaded of Him, we keep moving forward and God will show us where we're going when we get there, but let's get going. He never shows you the top of the staircase before He asks you to take the first step. And as believers, We just crash through the uncertainty because your destiny is one step of uncertainty away.